Good morning, everyone. And uh, I hope you have had a great Easter and that you're ready to continue the ESG journey, getting ready to report on CSRD. Welcome to this uh, PwC webinar on sustainability. For those of you that I haven't met before, uh, I'm Karina. I'm leading our sustainability department in uh, PwC. I've been working with sustainability for more than 15 years. I have provided both advisory services and assurance services on ESG for a big number of companies in most sectors. With me today, I've got Dorte from, from uh, SDC, and then I've got my colleague, Eric Johnson, from the sustainability department in PwC. Both Dorte and Eric will be presenting in a short minute, uh, so we'll get back to them. So at today's webinar, uh, we'll focus on DMA. We will especially be looking into learnings so far and also uh, into how it can be used not only to ensure compliance with CSRD, but also to, uh, to, to ensure value creation at your specific company by understanding the impact, risk and opportunities related to your specific company. As you see on the agenda, uh, what we will be doing today is that, first of all, Eric will be presenting or talking about experiences related to DMA. Afterwards, we'll have Dorte uh, providing you insights on your own experiences related to DMA. And then after that, there will be possibilities or open for questions and discussions. So if you've got any questions as we go along, then please use the chat to, uh, to post those questions. Also, if you're wondering, we will be sharing the slides and also uh, the webcast after the meeting. Handing over the word to you, Eric. Super, thank you so much, Karina. And uh, really happy to be here also. Really surprised and pleased that we have so many watching with us today. We have over, I think, 600 joining us this morning. So we were chatting about, gosh, are we really so popular or are people really just easing into the work week after uh, an Easter holiday? In any case, it's really great to be here with all of you. Uh, we're really proud of the work we've been doing at PwC with, uh, as Karina said, DMA or double materiality assessment. And I just wanted to share how big and how strong this team is. Uh, we've been working on double materiality assessment, ESG assurance for a number of years. What's new for us as a team here, both in, uh, in Copenhagen as well as in, uh, in Jutland, is that we are doing this in the context of the ESRS and the CSRD. So this new directive, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive that you probably heard so much about and which is why you're here. We won't be covering the basics of the CSRD today. If you're looking for that, we have an earlier webinar which is still available on our website. You can check it out and uh, we'll cover the basics there. But we will give you a fast introduction to the basics of the CSRD and the ESRS just to make sure everybody's on the same page. We decided today, and I have good news for you, we decided to give away all of our best secrets, uh, as many as we could pack in this short webinar because we really wanna help companies and motivate them to really use this process for, as Karina said, value creation. Yeah, but with that said, there is a, a brief disclaimer that the knowledge we're sharing here today, it's our best guess, it's our best opinion on a new directive, uh, a new set of standards, we're all trying to, to navigate together with uh, our global center of excellence in CSRD, as well as with all of the rest of the Danish and European business life. Um, today, my presentation will be structured around the questions I get most often when I'm talking with companies, as I'm doing every day. Um, what are the questions I get most often around ESRS and CSRD? So we're gonna try to answer as many of those as we can. So one of the first questions I often get is what are the main changes? What's the, what's the big picture here? Um, it is a significant extension of the scope of the sustainability reporting. Many Danish companies have been reporting on ESG in their annual reports for a while, um, mostly listed companies. Now that this is all large companies, if you're an accountant, it's Heinzgebs Class C or Accounting Class C in uh, large C in Denmark. Um, and you're going to be asked to report on a lot more, most likely, than you were before. It's at the level of the group. So what we often say is the daughter company, the subsidiary can point upwards if they want. 
uh, the mother or the parent company cannot point down. So that responsibility for reporting, it's at the group level. It will be tagged with XBRL, just like your uh, accounting numbers are, probably something most of you are not familiar with if you're not in accounting. But all of your information is digitally tagged to enable analysis across companies. And that same thing will also be happening with your ESRS reporting or CSRD reporting. It's the audit committee or the board at large which is responsible. So often people will say, hey, who should be driving this? Who should be leading this? And we say, well, it's not really up to discussion. Uh, it's a legal requirement that the board is responsible. So therefore, it's usually a really new role for the CFO, who's now playing a real driving leadership role on gathering and making sure that this information is high quality. It's in the first accounting year after 1st of January 2025 for large C companies. And if you're listed, then hopefully you've already set up your reporting systems because it's for this accounting year. Most of you will likely have seen a slide like this before. Um, and the question I get is, okay, this is 250 pages, Eric. We also know that there are uh, one set of value chain implementation guidelines draft. We have another set of materiality assessment implementation guidelines. Each one is 50 pages. Then we have a set of frequently asked questions from EFRAG. And because they didn't think that was enough, they give us another set of frequently asked questions. So overall, it's about 400 pages of reading at a minimum. It's a lot. What I say to CFOs is read ESRS 1. It's important that you know what the general principles are that you're expected to live up to with questions like consolidation, aggregation of information, what kind of accounting principles you should be following. And as well, anybody who's driving or playing a big role in this process, process you can't get around reading ESRS 2. That box at the left is the general disclosures. This is also the only mandatory disclosures uh, in this directive, um, but if you really want to understand how the, the double materiality assessment works, you've got to really spend the time to read ESRS 2. Unfortunately, the way it's structured, there are also cross-references back and forth to the other chapters spread throughout the, uh, the topical standards, which cover the different areas under E, S, and G. There are references back to double materiality assessment, but at the very least, you should read ESRS 2. One of the things that makes this so hard is that we don't have sector-specific standards over to the right. So the idea that every uh, company in uh, every sector across Europe has to apply means that we are navigating some gray zones here. Um, so take good care to pay attention to your sectoral risk, your geographical risk, and the entity size and complexity when figuring out where you should uh, be focusing in this exercise. In my experience, most companies really have a lot of internal knowledge about ESG, even if they don't consider this themselves ESG experts. They know what kinds of things are in their industry to pay attention to. On the screen right now is a pretty text-heavy slide that I nevertheless wanted to share with you because it gives a really good overview of what are the mandatory disclosures in ESRS 2. So they are split up into these four sections, the governance, the strategy, the IRO management, we'll get into that in a moment, and the metrics and targets. I'd like to ask you to focus on the top of two, strategy, and three, IRO management. And if we look at SBM1, SBM2, SBM3, IRO1 and 2, this is a lot of the stuff that you're going to be covering in your double materiality assessment. So when you perform the assessment, you're not only disclosing how did you determine what is material for your company to report on, you're also actually documenting how you made the choice of what to prioritize. And as Karina said, the biggest opportunity we have here as a company is really using this as an exercise to prioritize. So in my work in sustainability with companies, I'll often come out and say, what is your company doing? They'll say, Eric, we're doing great things. We've got solar panels on the roof. We've got a meat-free day in the kitchen. We've got electric cars in the parking lot. And I'll say, that's great. Which of these is giving the most value to society and environment? Mm, not so clear, not really sure. And I'll say, okay, what? which ones are giving the most value to your business? And they're equally unclear. So the double materiality process is a way to get to the bottom of what is delivering value to society and to the environment and what is delivering value to your business. It's really a big prioritization exercise. So if you're looking to drive value, that would be my first key tip is think about how can we really get more data, more information, a better understanding of which difference we make for society and environment that matters the most. When we talk about double materiality, you may have seen something like this before, 
We're talking about both the inside out perspective, in other words, how does my company affect the people and the environment around us, as well as how is my company affected by um, uh, the ESG factors that may affect my business. So for example, if we're producing something that has a lot of water, we may want to, in the production process, we may want to be aware, are we producing in a water-stressed area? Could we save water so we'll save on costs, but also save water for the surrounding area, and they'll be happy that our company is responsible and not depleting the water resources? It's those kind of gold nuggets we want to look for in this process. And the other key thing about this, uh, this slide is to pay attention that the ESRS is really asking us to look from a value chain perspective. So one of the things that's new in the ESRS, uh, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, is making sure that we really look up and down the value chain to identify where do we have impacts and where can we be impacted. We talk about impacts, risks, and opportunities, something I'll touch on a bit in a moment, but on this slide you can see how risks uh, and opportunities are on the financial side, the financial materiality, and the impacts are where we are having an impact on society and the environment as a company. Impacts can be positive, they can be negative, they can be actual, or they can be potential. But impacts are on the impact side, the inside outside, and financial is on the risks and opportunities. So the standards are structured in a way that's not always easy to navigate. And this slide kind of walks you through how do we structure the standards. You'll remember those big headlines before on the ESG topical standard slides where we have environmental, social, and governance. And under each of these, we have the 10 topical standards. Underneath them, we can fold out then into different other areas underneath them, subtopics and sub-subtopics. So in climate change, for example, it would include both climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, and energy as a subtopic. Underneath that, we have disclosure requirements, which listed on the, on the circles here as DR, and underneath those are nested in data points. So the process is really about navigating those impacts, risks, and opportunities we talked about on the last slide. That's really the core functional unit of the DMA process, the double materiality process, according to this new directive. So the example here talks about how we might have age discrimination in our company that might result in a reputational risk, and that would re result in an increased cost of recruitment, so a financial risk to our company. And then we can see how that IRO, that impact or risk, helps us to link up to the topic, subtopic, or sub-subtopic where it's located. And that enables the company to determine what's the disclosure requirement or data point I have to report on. We like to break this process up into four stages. Uh, they map very well with the uh, process or the structure of the ESRS itself. We call it mobilization, understanding, identification, and assessment. And as you work your way through every one of these, then you're essentially narrowing down what it is and beginning to prioritize for your company what it is you have to report on. Um, the mobilization part, I really can't stress enough how much of this has to do with people. So we really have found that it really pays to invest in talking to the people who are going to be involved in the process. So uh, who do I need to involve? We'll get to that a little bit in more detail later, but um, that mobilization phase, pay attention to good project management in, in doing this exercise. The next thing I would say that we've really learned is the business model description, value chain mapping, uh, identification of stakeholders, we really see this as the foundation for the following processes, uh, following steps in the process. So rather than just shooting from the blind and trying to find out which impacts, risks, and opportunities are relevant for our company, we really invest in also getting that foundation right and making sure we understand the business from a value chain perspective and in our experience, you may have noticed that the EFRAG guidelines, the guidelines from the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, advise you can both have a top-down or a bottom-up approach to your DMA, meaning you can either start with all of the topics and try to find all of the uh, impacts, risks, and opportunities underneath them, or you can start from the business model and try to think what's relevant to my business. We found in the mass, vast majority of cases that bottom-up approach makes more sense for companies. We found that otherwise, if you've got a top-down approach, you could end up with hundreds of IROs that you just end up sorting uh, out of the process anyway. 
And it's only for companies that really have a lot of risks uh, and impacts in, in high impact industries that it makes sense to, to go uh, top down. But again, really paying attention to those IROs, really making sure those IROs are well researched, have a lot of data behind them, both from within the company and from outside the company. And we really spend time making sure we mature those IROs and understand them before we get into the assessment phase uh, in the next part of the process. When we assess, it's important that we really read and understand the requirements of the ESRS. So they ask us to look at scale, scope, remediable character, or the degree of difficulty to repair the impact and likelihood on the impact side, and then a bunch of financial parameters on the other side. We do encounter organizations who've tried to do this on their own. And some of the common mistakes they will make is they won't follow these requirements or that they may just rush right to topics and subtopics and start trying to assess those rather than investing in the requirements of the ESRS, which are that we actually look at the impacts, risks, and opportunities. It takes us typically about three months, two to three months when we're working with a company that wants to do this uh, at a good tempo uh, and make sure that they're maturing the process. In other words, they're not rushing into it. Um, and that's typically also because a lot of the companies that we're working with, they're not having a big, large, sophisticated ESG department that may be two or three people in their ESG department. Sometimes we even meet clients that don't have uh, an ESG officer and it's just somebody who's maybe double hatted or two, has two roles. Um, and so having that, that longer process enables us to mature the process, make sure we're investing in the right time, we're getting all of the documentation surfaced, but also that people, typically have lots of other things to do uh, at the company. So it's not like they can just drop everything that they're doing and then just do the double materiality process full time. Uh, we have done it faster. We've done it faster for a few clients who really had a, a key burning platform to get it done quickly, but generally speaking about three months. I also like to say who should be in this project team. I usually say, you know, keep it small if you can and make sure that the people who are involved have sufficient time. We'd much rather have a small team who has sufficient time than 10 people who have 5% each. That's really something that can be a value drag and take a lot of time and uh, doesn't really contribute to a good process where nobody really feels ownership. That project coordinator is a really key role for this process. If you're out there and you're thinking we want to do a double materiality assessment or we have to, we don't have any ESG competency, I would say just make sure you get a really strong project coordinator who's able to motivate the organization with carrots and sticks. In my experience, it is a very hard thing to do the first time, uh, this ESRS. I'm saying not, not just because we do help a lot of clients doing this, but for most of them who've tried to navigate this the first time, uh, without using any kind of external advisor or expert, it can be tough simply because the directive and the standards are so difficult. Um, but get make sure you do have that strong port project coordinator, make sure you do have that strong sponsor at senior leadership level, both to create the burning platform, as well as to communicate across the organization how important this is. And recognize that there are also iterative loops in this process that you'll learn along the way. In terms of where you're getting the information from the company, who should I talk to, who should I involve? We wanted to give you this nice list of internal subject matter experts that we usually share with clients when they ask the same question. It's a generic list. It is a list that is not uh, specific to any industry, but it's a good starting point to think, okay, when I start involving internal stakeholders, who should I talk to? Who should be on my list of people to ask? Uh, we can start from this list and then build it out and set a line uh, over those that don't apply. I also like to tell clients, look, when we go hunting for this information across the company, try to do so with a harpoon rather than a net. In other words, don't get a big uh, uh, discussion with 10 different experts and everybody can uh, raise their hand and talk about which ESG topics they think are most important. This will likely lead your project to just have a lot of noise and an inability to prioritize and identify which ones are most important for you. It's better if the core project team is actually using a pretty data rich exercise and then verifying that information with internal subject matter experts, either at the beginning or after they've generated that list of IROs. We also often get asked, you know, what about focus groups? What about desk interview, desk research and interviews? And the answer is yes. Uh, we've seen some companies do this on a highly interview based approach 
with their internal subject matter experts. We've seen some say, hey, we'd rather do focus groups, um, particularly if you're a more mature organization when it comes to ESG. We had one where they would do uh, you know, two to three people on uh, the, the E topics, two to three people on the S topics, two to three people on the G topics, who were then able to debate and discuss together uh, because the assessment phase can involve some subjective opinions about you know, what is the expected impact and so forth. Um, so really find the approach that, that fits your organization um, if you ask me, hey, what, what should we do? We'd say start with your project team, get those IROs going, get those business model descriptions and, and stakeholder mapping going, and then reach out to the organization uh, either through interviews or through focus groups uh, based on your culture and the resources of the people involved. When it comes to external stakeholders, another common question we get is, Eric, do we have to go out and run around and make focus groups with our external stakeholders, meaning not just the customers or the suppliers, but also the people who might be affected by our products or services, either in the production phase or the use phase? And the answer is that the ES or S asks us to identify stakeholders. That's a requirement. It asks us to consider how they might be impacted and to uh, respond to how you might then change your business model or your strategy to respond to stakeholders, also the structure around how you're discussing with stakeholders, but it's not a specific explicit requirement that you go out and engage with your stakeholders. You can, for example, do this through proxies. You can do it through industry associations or watchdog groups, um, but you do have to identify who they are and how you engage with them, if at all. Um, we typically say, again, sectoral risk, geographical risk, entity size and complexity. For some clients, it's gonna be very important to go out and engage with stakeholders, particularly those in high risk industries, industries that have a lot of impact on stakeholders around the, the company. For others, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And again, this would be a value drag. This would be something where we're going around and asking people, what's your opinion about our company? Um, and, and they're barely aware that the company even exists. So rounding up, uh, spend time on your IROs, on your impacts, risks, and opportunities. This really is a critical part of the process. Make sure you are happy with that list and you understand how they're described. They're clearly identifying uh, the stakeholder affected, which value chain activity, where it's happening, and make sure you're maturing that list before you get into assessment. It'll make the assessment list a lot easier. Another common mistake we say is when people are either describing impacts, risks, and opportunities, or assessing the risks, they will do so based on what we call gross risk or uh, the risk, uh, I'm sorry, they'll do so on um, the risk after a mitigating action is put in place. We want them to assess gross risk. In other words, we want them to assess what we call uh, inherent risk, uh, not after, not residual risk, not after the mitigating action is put in place. So for example, we have a risk of child labor in our industry. However, we have a, a, a lot of really good policies um, to make sure that there's no child labor, so that's not a risk wrong. We'd want to say we have a risk of child labor in our industry and then assess the potential likelihood and impact of that risk. And then we put in the, the due diligence measures with our suppliers or our own organization to make that sure that's not a, a risk that materializes. So make sure you're assessing before you do the mitigating actions. If you're navigating gray zones in this directive, we're always saying, hey, define your criteria, document how you're applying those criteria and follow it consistently. It's really important that we remember that this is a reporting directive and not a behavioral directive, which means there are no absolute thresholds for what should be assessed material or not material. There is, however, uh, some, some thresholds quantitative with some of these KPIs, but the point being that we need to make sure this is an audit ready process, that we have our audit documentation for how we conducted the process absolutely clear, we have uh, four eyes uh, checking the information. We've documented that several actors who have been within the company are sufficiently mandated and equipped to make these judgments have done so. Document, document, document. We want to do this with our audit in mind and make sure we're making it easier for auditors and our stakeholders to understand the content of the, of this, the double materiality assessment. Finally, last little gold nugget is around the precedence of human rights when we're reviewing other uh, double materiality assessments done by other companies or advisors, we see that there's a, a mistake involved where when we're assessing different impacts, if the severity of a human rights impact uh, is, is sufficient, it should be overweighted uh, when you're assessing the different impacts. So in other words, if there's a risk of a death or if there's a risk of a serious human rights abuse, then the other factors of severity and likelihood 
they are they are just escalated to make sure that we don't overlook serious human rights abuses when we're doing our assessment because they're simply not very likely. So make sure you read the ESRS 2 on that point and follow it when you're assessing your human rights uh, impacts. I think that's all I've got to share today. I wish I could share so much more that we've done from these assessments, but I think my contact details are in the end of the, yes. Thanks a lot, Eric. Sure. Super uh, good. Uh, before moving on to daughter, we just got a question, which I think is uh, super important to get in place. So the question is, when making a DMA, should it be based on disclosure uh, requirements and data points? When making the DMA, it's on the IROs, right? So these impacts, risks, and opportunities. And I understand the question because it, it can be confusing. Um, what we want to do is we want to make our list of IROs, our impacts, risks, and opportunities. This is one of the actual requirements of the ESRS. It was on one of those first slides there. Then we assess the IROs. On the basis of the IRO assessment, then we draw that line back to the topic, subtopic, and sub-subtopic, figure out which area are we looking at, and then that will lead to which disclosure requirements and data points are material. So for example, my company uses a lot of water, therefore there is a risk that we will deplete water resources, that's our impact. On the basis of that, we'll go back to the topic, water withdrawals, or I'm sorry, it's subtopic, water withdrawals, and then under water withdrawals, we'll see, okay, there's some disclosure requirements and data points here I'm going to have to report on. Exactly. So it's at the very end of that process. Uh, and maybe just one more question, and that is, what is the end result of a DMA? Yeah, so your end result of your DMA, you'll, you'll end up with your material uh, um, impacts, risks, and opportunities. After that, then you need to go back and do what we call the determination, which is then you're going to figure out, okay, on this list of material impacts, risks, and opportunities, which disclosure requirements and data points are going to apply and be material for disclosure. And think about who's going to be reading this report, right? Who are the intended users of the information, either from a financial or from an impact side? Very good. So uh, we've got more questions, but we'll come back to that uh, later. Now we'll leave the, the word to you, Dorit. Yes, thank you so much for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here and also for all you attending the webinar uh, about this uh, super exciting area. So I'm here to present a case uh, from SDC where I work, uh, and that is because we have worked together with a very dedicated team here in PVC in terms of our DMA process. But first, a little bit about uh, my company and, and myself. So I'm Dorte Rohe Østerdal. I work as head of ESD and uh, I joined um, in April 2023, so last year. It's a new role in SDC, so that also means that uh, SDC is, is now taking an, and uh, more active um, ambitions within the ESD agenda that we want to raise. And that is uh, within the company, but it is also together with our customers. I have a long experience within ESD for many years, and uh, it has been in PFA, so the largest commercial Danish pension company, but also from Leo Pharma, which is in the pharmaceutical industry and, and known for very compliance-driven area. Then I've also worked in uh, Sanofi, the competitor of uh, Novo Nordisk, and I see that the ESD is a uh, on the agenda of board of directors, but also top management. And that is why I also thought it could be very interesting for myself to take some executive training. And I've done that at the AVT Business School within strategic leadership and also the program named Purpose, People and Performance. And uh, my educational background is that uh, I graduated in law many years ago. So yes, this is me. Uh, I'm very excited about ESD in general, but very excited about the CSRD. Uh, I think it's a very interesting new area and very important, not only for the companies, but also for the world in, in general. So if we look about uh, SDC, maybe some of you know my company, uh, maybe some don't. Um, it is that uh, we offer small and medium-sized Nordic banks, uh, a core banking system platform that also supports security and compliance requirements. So it means that uh, 
its development, its maintenance, but it's also joint IT purchase. So the whole started with uh, small and medium-sized banking going together to find how can we collaborate on this uh, complex area. We call it a great banking experience, and that is uh, for advisors in the banks, but it's also for the end users in the banks. And uh, we aim to have a competitive price. If you look at uh, our customers, that is uh, uh, around 50 small and medium-sized companies, and we are uh, around 647 employees. It also means that uh, there is 1.8 million end users. And when you look at the customers accounts within the SCC banks, it is uh, 5.6 million. And we are primarily in the Nordic region. So that was a little bit about SDC. Then when we look about our ESG profile, so we are a provider of critical financial infrastructure in the Nordics, and that also comes with a responsibility. We are UN Global Compact member, and we support the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and we actively work with goal number five and also goal number eight. And when we work with the E, so environmental, uh, it is uh, that we have an ambition towards CO2 neutrality, and that is uh, with a baseline of 2022. Within the E, uh, and that was within the E. Within the S, um, so social, we work under the umbrella attractive workplace. And that is everything that comes with that. So personnel and well-being policies, but it's also that we take the temperature of our employees. So that means satisfaction surveys, and we work, as I said before, to, um, towards diversity, inclusion, and gender equality. When we come to the G, so governance, it is, uh, since we are the company we are, of course, IT security is, is very important, but also the whole data protection, uh, the GDPR, and also, of course, we have a whistleblower and uh, ESG policy. And then we also uh, work together with suppliers, and that means that we also have a supplier code of conduct that is presented to our SDC suppliers. So that was about uh, ESG in SDC, but uh, we only we also work together with our customers uh, towards sustainable banking. That is our ESG ambition, and that is in close cooperation with our customers. And that is because the banks has a key role in in the transformation towards a more sustainable world. So, as many maybe know, there has been high regulation about this area. So together with our customers, together with the banks, we are providing also ESG solutions, which we see is, is becoming more and more important for our banks. So the next slide that I have uh, here for us at today's session, it is I would like to put some attention to our CSRD readiness. Um, it is that the SCC welcomes the growing focus on ESG in the business community, but we also decided that it's really important to work under the umbrella with a CSRD readiness approach. And that is really to meet the future complex requirements. Um, as you just heard from the presentation of Eric, there is a lot that uh, is will be the next step for companies, also in, in, in terms of compliance reporting. So, so that is also why we took the, the, the choice of uh, entering collaboration with PVC, and we have been met with a very dedicated team here. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. And, and that uh, process of about the DMA, that has been part of our readiness. Um, the next will be that then we will follow up by a roadmap. Um, but I'm mentioning this uh, as an idea for if you are um, looking into how you should get started and work with the CSRD, it can be really nice to have uh, a CSRD readiness plan and also with the commitment of the CFO. And that is the commitment that uh, I have, together with uh, the working group, uh, been working with. If you look at uh, our situation, it is that uh, we need to report due to the CSRD directed by the financial year of uh, 2025. So even though it seems as there is some time, I feel that also um, there's a lot of work to do. 
Uh, as a new, uh, it is that STC has uh, launched a new commercial strategy, and I would also like to mention that EST is now part of the commercial strategy. It has its own principle of delivery, which we call ESG by design. So the next slide uh, that I wanted to share with you today, this morning, um, it is an overview of the process. So, so this is the collaboration that we had with PVC. As you can see, we started out with the CSRD readiness plan. So, so it was approved and also it, it contained uh, the DMA. Then we decided that we wanted to, to have a, a small working group, um, as it was also mentioned by, by yeah. Eric earlier. We also saw that as an advantage. So the working group uh, consisted of me and then my colleague. Um, I come with the ESD background and he comes with the financial background. And I think that that has been a wonderful collaboration. It has really also had great discussions also in terms of uh, when we look at the the, the way of uh, approaching this. We started out uh, with a kick off workshop. And uh, if I should summarize, um, you may be wondering like how many workshops, how many interviews was it? Um, and uh, when I count how many workshops it has been, um, the number is six. Um, we have also had a steering group meetings uh, during the way. And I also think that of course that is super important. You cannot just only have one steering group meeting at the end. You need, of course, also to, to give information to the CFO regularly, um, also in case that uh, there are some, some, some uh, information that needs to be adjusted. So I would say at minimum two steering group meetings. And then in our case, we started out in October 2023. Um, we had, uh, after the kickoff workshop, we had um, the business model and value chain mapping. Um, and then later it was, as Eric just also uh, mentioned, we had the identification and validation of uh, impact risk and opportunities. For that session, which was in November and December, we had um, that we really look through like who are our internal stakeholders in SDC, who are the ones that knows the business even better than we. And we looked at um, within environment, within governance and within social. So that uh, was, for example, uh, our HR department, it was procurement, it was sales, it was IT security and, and so on. I think that for each company, it's of course individual where you find your internal stakeholders. Um, in our case, a lot of the the, the interview candidates uh, is actually within the finance and business uh, support group. So that also means that uh, the managers report into the CFO. And our CFO has uh, already before uh, we started out with uh, the kickoff workshop also arranged that we had internal communication that now the CSRD is coming. We have the CSRD readiness plan. Next step is the DMA and, and we need your help. So that also provided a very good way of, of working for me and my colleague and that we already had uh, communicated that this was coming. Please prioritize it. And it also made us uh, possible of meeting all the deadlines set from, from PVC. As you can see in, in terms of uh, the next, then it was continu continually, um, we needed to have the validation of the results so that we didn't go off in a, in a wrong way. And then, of course, also we had um, the impact and financial materiality assessment. Um, I think that um, it has been such a good process um, and I'm very... Um, it's very positive that the process was less than six months because that also means that you are together with your colleagues, um, you can have a result uh, pretty fast, um, but it's also a very vital result because this is uh, really a cornerstone for, for, for our future work. And then um, after the impact and financial materiality assessment, then we had um, the final steering committee meeting and that was where then we had the final DMA. And that was then uh, approved. So uh, this is an overview of, of the final assessment of SDC. 
So if you look at the, um, the assessment, then it was that it resulted in five typical standards that was triggered uh, with associated material impact risk and opportunities. So, so this is uh, our uh, cornerstone. This is our guiding star. This is how we will work ahead. Um, as you can see, it also plays very well with the our strategy as it is, but of course it also needs to be revisited um, due to the complexity in the details of all the, the topical standards and all um, what we have to also look into um, in, in terms of this. So you may wondering like what is uh, our next steps because it, it doesn't end with the DMA process. Um, we are, as I said before, so happy that we now have the final result. It's been a long wait uh, for that, uh, even though it was less than, than six months. So next step for us is really the gap analysis. Uh, we have to look in which data points do we have now? What is the quality of the data? But we also have to look into all the new data points. Um, and that could also be that uh, there could be a policy that needs to be written or we need to approach definition differently. I think that this is also a very exciting area because that is also uh, some data points that will be able to, for us to raise the ESG agenda as we have already said that we want. And now also within a very structured way and it will also be possible for us to benchmark um, us even better against the other companies. Then of course the governance for data. Uh, we all know that if you have uh, even more data points, then also you need to have a very good structure. And that is also uh, in terms of the, the when your uh, auditor has to, to look into the double materiality assessment. Um, so we also need to, to look into that. And, and the good news is that uh, we are already now um, looking into a system support of data. So it means that we are scanning the market, like could there be some uh, technical support platform where we can not only gather the data, but it could also be maybe um, a work in process um, so that you can assign like this data point needs to be um, put in from HR and, and so on. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that will also be very interesting to see where, where we land. And then as Eric said um, very good earlier, <clears throat> since there are so, so many new uh, reporting requirements, of course, we are also looking into how, how should the concept of our new report look like. Um, so it will include the CSRD and then um, the whole uh, readiness for audit approval. Um, what we have learned from, from this process with the dedicated team of PVC is that the um, final DMA that we now have in our hands, I, I have it here, um, that is uh, that we can send for audit approval. And that is also what, I, what I'm very happy about because uh, as we all know, that is super important. So if I should sum up with uh, what I feel that is uh, the learnings of uh, SDC, in regards to the DMA process together with uh, the dedicated team in PVC and also my colleagues uh, in SDC. It is really that <clears throat> this DMA is now our cornerstone in our future work. Um, learnings is also really get this internal commitment. This is not uh, a one man show at all. And that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's really not about me going to other departments saying you should have a data point here or not. This is really to be embedded in the organization and raised also by the, the CFO. Um, it really needs to be that you uh, get to own your data. You get also the insight of your data. You get a, a whole new way of also looking at possibility to raise your own sustainability agenda, which is just so important um, also in the situation that the world is in right now. Then I'm also thinking that learnings really get started, get the CSRD readiness plan approved, or maybe you are already there, but really just get started and, and, and go into this because there are so many details. Um, we, think, we think that it has been really um, recommendable to, to interact with an external company. And, and the reason for that is, is 
we see that there is a high level of complexity, but it's also this whole um, structure about have a facilitated process. Uh, and that goes to, to the, to the pre-audit approval. Um, then I also think that the meeting deadlines, we have, uh, we have really done hours to meet the deadlines and that has uh, PVC also, but that also means that we had an answer within less than, than six months. And then I also think that uh, it is it is a new area. It's a new area for many people. Uh, there are so many details, and maybe you could at some point be the one that had answers to all questions. But I would say in these uh, circumstances, sometimes you also need to say that thank you for your question. I need to come back to you, and then that can also be super good to to have um, a big team and a big organization that is so close to EFRAC. Then I also think that this whole prioritized readiness, but also to communicate, communicate uh, over a lunch or a coffee or tell, go to other uh, meetings um, within the organization and, and tell what it is that you are working with and, and how you also can engage them. That can also be um, one of the learnings from, from this process. And then in case that you want to read more about SCC or about our ESG profile, please feel free to, to also uh, look into our website. Thank you so much, Dori, for these uh, super interesting uh, insights. Um, we are receiving a lot of questions, uh, so let's try to, uh, to cover at least, uh, or do our best to, to cover at least some of them. But maybe to start off, thanks a lot for providing these sort of insights on your, on your key learnings going along, along the journey. Now that you sort of look at it from uh, after having finalized this, this important DMA, were there any surprises during the process? Anything that if you should have done it again, that you would have done differently? Um, thank you for this question uh, I, that I very appreciate. Um, I think that... Um, one of my learnings is really how, how valuable the, the final product is. So, so, so the DMA that we now have, uh, it is, uh, I think it's very valuable for us. We, we have worked with a lot of the areas already, but, but I think that the analysis now is, is even more detailed also. Um, and then I also think that uh, uh, I have worked with also a human rights impact assessment on, on group level. I've also worked with other impact assessments. Uh, what surprised me here was really the level of detail. And that is why I also think that it's, it can be super good to have uh, the interaction with the external company. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that answers uh, to some extent one of the other questions, which is on what documentation is needed. Uh, because as you say, there are lots of requirements uh, described uh, with regards to what should be included in a DMA. And that's, that's actually one of the key answers to that question on what, what do you need to be able to, to obtain uh, assurance. That is that you are able to document that you followed all these different steps as described in ESIS 1. So, so an, another person from outside needs to be able to, to understand and follow and ensure that you followed all these different steps. If I could add there, that's where I think finance departments really can play a great complement to ESG colleagues is finance department colleagues understand what it means to go through a financial audit every year. So that whole process of describing who made the decision, how was the decision made? Is there a change log for any changes that were made along the way? Uh, a key thing we often find is when a company is concluding that something is material or not, what basis are you basing that decision on? And here, if you can refer to an external third party source, like a, uh, an analysis from a, uh, a fact-based uh, organization that is doing analyses on, for example, human rights or, or labor risks or, or environmental risks, it really helps to make sure that this is as data-rich and well-founded as possible by an objective third party. If I could just insert one little comment that I forgot to make in my presentation, um, it's around the role of the external advisor. So for uh, PwC as an audit firm, we are never able to perform a double materiality assessment for clients. 
uh, that would expose us to the risk of what we call self-review, meaning that we would be doing something that we'd later then go in and provide an audit opinion on. So what we're doing typically is working with, with companies like SDC and, and teaching them to fish rather than catching the fish for them, if you will. So we are really playing that role of advisor, of coach, of, of Stephen, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, your, um, your, your, your pathfinder. But we are, um, all of the decisions are made by the company and it's our intention always that after the assessment is done, the company should be able to perform this on their own without any external assistance in the future. Yeah. And then, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, there is another question. Uh, somebody is wondering about, you said you started the DMA process six months ago, but that was before the, uh, the DMA uh, guidance came out. So how did you do that? And maybe that's a more general question on that we are sort of operating in a, an area where, I mean, we've got the guidance on DMA, but it's actually only in draft form. So we're still waiting for the final one. So, so how did you, or I don't know who of you wants to answer this question, I don't know, how do you navigate in this uh, world of uh, uh, having to sort of ensure that you start the journey on complying with CSRD at the same time as the regulation is being developed and finalized? Yeah, I can maybe um, say one thing and then Eric can support me. Um, well, I think, thank you so much for the question. It's, it's really a, a good question. I think our approach was to to get get started now. And as I started out saying that we will first uh, report for the financial year 2025. So it also means that it gives us the flexibility to go back um, and, and revisit if, if there are any new uh, things that, that uh, is coming in that direction. But I still think that it has been extremely valuable to start out now. And the reason why I'm saying that is that um, it takes a lot of time, mm. but it's also um, a very, very um, interesting journey to get your to get to know your business even better. You know the business model, all the layers. All, all there are a lot of very valuable questions that you can ask yourself. Mm. Um, so I hope that that is uh, yeah a question. I don't know. Do you want to? How did you navigate the uncertainty? Like, so you came out early, you started early, but then you had questions, I'm sure, along the way and reading the, as, as Karina said, the value chain implementation guidelines and, and sometimes the answers aren't in black and white, right? Yes. Um, I think that uh, sometimes it's also a strategic choice. Do you mm. want to, do you, do you dare to, to go out even though um, nothing, every, mm. not everything has been sorted out for you? And I think that this was a choice for STC. Uh, and the reason why we have this choice is also we see that this is very important for our customers. Mm -hmm. So it's also uh, important for us. Um, and then also I think that uh, the way I look upon it is to that, that we are actually building the road while, while we're also getting to know uh, the road. And, and I think that uh, for us it has been a good choice. Mm -hmm. Great. I would just add, we advise clients to get started now because some of the data points that they have to report on, you'll be wanting to have a formalized accounting practice at the start of the accounting year. So for uh, data points such as number of employees, we can pull these out at the end of the year. But for example, if you're calculating scope 2 GHG emissions for the first time and reporting on those publicly, those are pulled from your finance system typically. You're going to want to have that defined by 1st of January if your accounting year starts then. So you don't have a lot of time to get that accounting practice set up to start your double materiality assessment now. Um, the, the, in terms of the uncertainty, I think the taxonomy uh, gives us a pretty good, how do I say, uh, historical precedent for understanding how to do this. The taxonomy, uh, listed companies have been reporting on the taxonomy for, for two years now in accounting year 21 and 22. Um, and there was still a lot of uncertainty when they were reporting. So what a lot of companies did in their annual reports was simply define how they navigated the uncertainty, how they were applying this accounting principle, make sure they apply it consistently, and then document how they're applying that accounting principle. And I think the same will, will happen with the ESRS. Keep your finger on the pulse. See what your, your competitors and customers are expecting, what your intended users of the report are expecting. Get into webinars like this, which you're obviously doing right now. But then if you're, if you're still at reporting time, you have uncertainty, put it in the annual report how you've understood a given uh, requirement and how you're fulfilling it and document how you fulfill it. Thank you. All right, so let's move into uh, to, to, uh, to the next steps. 
First of all, we have a question on somebody who have heard that E1, so that's on climate change, and also S1 on own workforce, that these, these are mandatory to report on. Is that true, Eric? Yeah, if I can say it in Danish. Det kan vi afmystificere med det samme. No, they are not mandatory. Um, uh, e, uh, ESRS 2, the general disclosures, these are the mandatory. This is actually one of the first key changes that we saw going from the earlier draft standards to the final standards, which were improved, was that E1 was no longer mandatory. That being said, I have yet to have a single uh, Danish client amongst the 40 or 50 of these that we've done in the past year who hasn't found at least some elements of E1 and S1 and G1 to be material. So for many companies, this is just a question of reputational risk. In Denmark, for example, climate change is really on top of mind for lots of stakeholders. But uh, ESRS 2 uh, are the mandatory disclosures. Exactly. So uh, then there is a question on, on the content of the CSRD readiness plan that you, you shared. You already explained sort of the next steps. But maybe uh, you can elaborate a little bit on what do you see as the key challenges or where will you put your key focus on the next steps in getting ready for CSRD reporting? Yes. Thank you. That's also a very good question. Well, well that is uh, the gap analysis. So right now we're looking into, so we have the result. What does it actually also mean for us? Yeah, exactly. So you're moving from having identified the key impact risks and opportunities to what are the material topics, subtopics. Then based on that, you can identify which of these 1200 data points that we are sort of everyone, you know, lots of people are talking about which of them should you sort of be reporting on. And then you do your, your gap and assessment based on that. So that's a key point because then based on that, you can actually sort of start making a plan on how you will make sure to close these gaps. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. All right, time is uh, is is running fast. Any uh, so so maybe it's actually time to to round up to mm -hmm. uh, to say to thank you all. Thank you, daughter, for uh, for sharing your insights and uh, and experiences. And thank you, Eric, uh, for also sharing everything that you've been learning so far. This is certainly an area. That is sort of that that we keep developing. That that is developing as we talked about, and and therefore we are also in PwC offering a number of uh, of, of webinars. Uh, on this slide, you see uh, different upcoming webinars. So please look into uh, PwC. Dk's uh, webpage to uh, to sign up for our upcoming uh, webcasts. Thanks a lot to all of our, all of you to uh, for spending your time on on listening uh, and and contributing with your many questions. We did our best to cover it all. Thanks a lot, um, and see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you.